Today I'll walk you through the software development lifecycle. First we'll review most common phases and then I'll share several critical concepts that you must know about SDLC. So, software development lifecycle or SDLC is just a sequence of project phases that you need to get through to create a software application. Yes, there are common phases that we use to describe the process of software development, however, you can use different names for the phases as well. Don't focus too much on the names, the work and its nature are of importance here. Usually a software development project starts with a pre-sales phase. It's not actually a project management phase, but it's important phase for you as a project manager, because lots of initial agreements are made during this phase and you want to control them. Just keep in mind that before the actual project management phase start, there is a whole process of finding clients and selling them your services. In large enterprise companies, the process isn't that far from the client-vendor relationships. It's just an internal process of selecting which projects to invest money in. After the contract is signed, you get into the initiation phase. Here you need to identify what's the goal of a project and its success criteria. Even if you are under times and materials contract, it's vital to get through this phase. Therefore, you need to create a project charter. Or at least you need to define the key information that it has. I have an in-depth video on the project chart and I strongly recommend you reviewing it next. I'll leave you a link in the description. Second important step is to identify key stakeholders. Why? You'll need a lot of input on many aspects of software development. User interface, user experience, technical information, hardware specifics, development environment, software architecture, and so on. Ok, don't expect to get all these details from your clients and customers. You will need to include internal expertise, including stakeholders outside of your team. Well, the result of this phase is usually a signed project charter. Once you have an understanding of the project and its goals, you can continue to the next phase, concept development phase. There are many different ways to develop a software application. I prefer to follow the design first approach. So how does it work? First of all, you need to develop a conceptual design and wireframes for the future application. It shouldn't be fully detailed, but it should provide a framework for future requirements definition activities. On the other hand, it gives tangible results to your stakeholders. They'll be more engaged in the whole project when a difficult process of software development is simplified to images of the future product. Another aspect of concept development is technical. Sometimes the required product is totally unique, or it has requirements that don't have existing examples and no available solution will provide the desired outcome. So you need to develop a brand new technological concept. You'll need to curate the top subject matter experts in your field to generate ideas and solutions, at least at a high level. For really big software development projects, you can break this phase into several additional phases like actual concept development, prototyping and feasibility phase. Therefore, most of the times it's a gateway phase. If you do have an acceptable solution, you will continue the project. If the solution requires resources and time beyond constraints, you may need to cancel the project. Many projects die at this gate. The most common tangible results of this phase are a decision to proceed, a prototype or a selected approach to implement the project. Next comes the requirements definition phase. So after you plan how to manage the project, you need to find out what you need to develop. In this phase, you can use all the available options to define requirements like brainstorming, interviews, focus groups, questionnaires and surveys, document analysis, mind mapping, wireframes, user stories and many other cool things. There is no one specific approach that fits all possible cases of collecting requirements. In the end, you need requirements that software engineers understand. However, sometimes a simple tweak in the requirements can cause a significant change in required efforts. So you do want to keep an eye on, on such opportunities to simplify the future product. So after that, you may want to incorporate high-level feasibility analysis here again. 
and the results of the requirements phase are written specifications, user stories, or any other type of requirements documentation. Once you have requirements, you'll move into the design phase. Again, there are at least two aspects here – technical architecture and UI UX design. If you didn't follow the design-first approach, you do it here. Otherwise, you finalize your designs in this phase. So during this phase, you need to analyze the collected requirements. After that, develop an architecture that will support them. Also, you need user interface that will make the application or service usable. The results of this phase are mockups, wireframes, workflow diagrams, architectural description documentation, lists of technologies, frameworks, and libraries. With all requirements collected, we can start the planning phase. In large IT projects, you'll need to create a full project management plan. So if you face such a task, I recommend you to review my in-depth article on project planning. I'll leave you a link in the description. However, in the beginning you'll work on smaller projects and planning will be simple here. So here's the truth for you. Many software development companies develop a custom project management approach. It's naturally formed in the process of company growth, so you'll need to follow either an utterly customized approach or a variation of Scrum or Kanban. In this case, project planning boils down to identifying project scope, estimation of time and cost, and setting milestones. And sometimes you'll need to identify required resources and expertise. All other aspects of project management will be predefined by the customs of this organization. Therefore, at the end of this phase, you'll either have a project management plan or you'll just commit to delivering specific scope by specific deadline, while the rest is internal problem. Well, your problem. Alright, when you have the plan, you can start writing actual code and test cases. That's where we get into the development phase or implementation phase. So in this phase, you'll get into the day-to-day -day execution of the project plan. Software developers will set up the working environment and will start writing the code. So you'll do the actual work of a project manager here by organizing people to do the work under the selected framework. For the sake of the better quality and engaged stakeholders, you can do it in iterative and incremental manner. Most of IT projects use Scrum, Scaled, Agile Framework or Kanban. So what does it mean for you if you are not a software development project manager? You'll develop a working piece of the application, you'll show it to your stakeholders, and after that your stakeholders will provide feedback. You'll integrate the changes to the project scope and the cycle repeats until you get the desired application. Yeah, it's different from construction projects. In software development, we do changes to the product in the process of development quite a lot. However, there is a catch. Such an approach doesn't exempt you from delivering the project on time and within budget. Your clients will have hard deadlines and constraints. You need to meet them. Optionally, next you may have an integration phase, because nowadays you will really see an application that doesn't integrate with other services or applications. In enterprise environment, you will often see that employees' data and credentials are stored in separate servers. You may need to integrate with it to get access to the databases of employees. The storage space is often outsourced to one of the third-party providers like Amazon, Dropbox, Microsoft, and so on. So you need to integrate with them as well. All in all, you need to integrate your piece of software with the business processes of the company or a market in which you will sell your application. This phase usually requires a lot of collaboration and it can be time-consuming. So you better plan this one ahead of time. Do pay close attention to the possible risks and integration requirements of other services. Well, quite often integration is a part of development, however, if there are a lot of efforts involved, it's better to get it done in a separate phase. Alright, once you have the application ready, you'll move into the testing phase. You can call this phase as acceptance testing or the final testing. You need to understand that you should be testing your application continuously from the beginning. 
Moreover, you need to prevent defects in the process of development, rather than fixing them. Ideally, your application should be stable and without serious defects all the time, so it's a matter of quality assurance that you planned and executed in all previous phases. In this phase, you need to certify that the version of application you are testing is of the required quality. It doesn't mean that the application has no defects at all, they are present, but they do not prevent people from using the application. And what's more important, your clients agree to this statement. So you do need to provide the list of all known defects in the application as part of quality certificate. It's the main result of this phase. After that we'll have a deployment phase. The software doesn't work without hardware. Be that a server, your PC or Mac or a mobile device, you need to deliver your application or service there. Moreover, the deployment of a big and complex application can be a project in itself. You need to set up servers, upload your application, connect it with all other services and servers, and sometimes you need to migrate or update the existing data. In regards to mobile devices and desktops, you need to create an installer for the application. You may also need to submit the application package to the market, like App Store or Google Play. All in all, the result of this phase is your application or service available to the end users. By the way, if you find it hard to understand all these concepts of development, do check my article on the technical skills an IT project manager needs. I'll leave you a link in the description. Ok, after that, the project doesn't end and it moves into the hypercare phase. This phase takes place for a few weeks or months after an application hits the market. Large amounts of users start using the app and they do find defects that you missed. So your team will be on the standby to fix any critical defects. Next we'll have handoff, closure or support phases. The handoff process can also require a lot of efforts. First you need to collect all the generated knowledge about the application and its specifics. And then you need to transfer this knowledge to the support team. Also, you may need to create some documentation and implement specific capabilities to administrate the service and so on. So if this is the case, you do need to identify such requirements early on. And I always recommend that you think about handoff process at the beginning of the project. Ok, here's what I want you to understand. Any application is maintained and supported throughout its whole lifetime. It's a part of the product life cycle. That goes beyond the project life cycle. So usually project team hands off the application to a smaller support team for ongoing maintenance. Hey, by the way, the sponsor of this video is my free career change cheat sheet. It's challenging and overwhelming to get your first project management role in IT industry. This cheat sheet gives you an action plan to get promotion to APM in the nearest future. If you want to become an IT project manager, you need to get a copy of this cheat sheet. Link is in the description. Ok, that's not all. There are several crucial aspects of software development lifecycle that I want you to remember after this video. First of all, SDLC is not a waterfall model. Waterfall in project management describes actual approach of how to sequence and work through phases. Software development lifecycle is just a set of these phases and the work you need to perform in them to create a software application. So as DLC describes different in nature work that needs to be done. You can shape and order this work in many different ways and Waterfall describes just one of the possible approaches to do it. What's that noise? Who's Second, phases of SDLC can overlap and go in parallel. As I just told you, Waterfall describes how to sequence the phases, and in Waterfall they go one after another. In a different plan-driven project management approach, phases can overlap. This leads us to the point number three. So what happens in Agile frameworks? Even if you use some Agile approach, the SDLC stays in place. You simply organize the work in a different fashion. You take some phases and break them down into smaller pieces. 
Then you group these pieces from different phases and work on them in iterations rather than as a one big phase. So don't mystify it. Next, what is an agile project management? Agile project management is just an approach in which some phases of a project are done using Scrum or Kanban. It usually means that you perform execution phases in an agile way. If you want to become a project manager, do check the link in the description and get your copy of the career change cheat sheet and do review other useful resources. If you are new here, subscribe to this channel, there will be more videos on project management and leadership. Now it's your time to talk. Do you work under Scrum or Kanban right now? Leave me a comment below this video. Thanks for watching. See you next time.